in the Word of God, 2 Chronicles 28. And uh, as you're turning, the children, four years old up through third grade, all the children four years old up through third grade, you can follow Miss Amber out the back for children's Bible time. 2 Chronicles chapter 28 in the Word of God. Second Chronicles chapter 28. I hope you got your Sunday afternoon nap in. How many of you got your Sunday afternoon nap in? Let's see. Okay. How many of you didn't? Oh, how many of you wish you had? <laughs> Almost. How many of you are not voting? Oh, okay. We got a couple. All right. They're just kind of checking this out. They never heard of it. Well, you know what saint stands for. Sunday afternoon is nap time. So just remember that, and uh, that'll help you the next Sunday. Next, next Sunday, you'll come to church. All, although, I don't know. It seems like everybody got their Sunday afternoon nap in the way you were singing. That was just good singing right there, and I thank the Lord for it. Let's pause and ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word, shall we? Father, I thank you for the privilege that you've given to me to speak tonight. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd help me as I speak, not to preach in my own strength and my own wisdom, but in yours and Lord, I pray that you do something special in our midst and in our heart tonight. I pray, Father, that you will work in uh, this service, Lord, to set the pace and set the tone for our heart, seeking you with all that we have. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do, because we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Corey Ten Boom wrote in her writings and journals, it was in a church in Munich, that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. Their solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence. In silence, they collected their wraps. And in silence, they left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocket rather than take that hand. He would not remember me. How, how, how could he remember me, just one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood ran cold. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. 
But since that time he went on, I, I have become a Christian. I, I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there, but I would like to hear it from, from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed like an eternity. As I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. But I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition. That we forgive those who trespass against us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who chose to forgive and were able to do so were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nurtured bitterness and hatred remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And still, still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not just an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hands into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. Does it seem to you as it seems to me that this world is filled with a whole lot of anger? Anger that's fomenting on the outside and fomenting on the inside. And yet this anger is so very much a part of our world. This anger is very much a part of the human heart. And God gives us a remedy for the anger that we face. There were many people in the Bible who were angry. God asked Jonah, doest thou well to be angry? We studied someone this morning named Cain who was angry. Doest thou well to be angry? God asked Cain. God asked many people in the Bible that same question. And there was anger in the Bible. Anger because of injustice. Anger because of wrongs. Anger because of hurts, past and present. Anger because of political sides. Anger because of political situations. Anger everywhere. Does it seem to you as it seems to me that there's just a whole lot of anger in this world? And a political party, I want you to know, wants to manipulate your anger to their advantage. I hope you do understand that on either side. That, that it's very, it behooves us as Christians to keep level heads and make sure that our hearts and minds are right when it comes to this matter of anger and that we're thinking clearly and not just letting our emotions, though they are a valid part of our life, drive us. They should not be in the driver's seat. And so I want to I just preach to you for a few moments this evening on the subject when God interrupts your anger. And I've come to our passage in 2 Chronicles chapter number 28. Would you turn there? 2 Chronicles chapter 28. I draw your attention to what the Bible says in verse number 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse number 1. It says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. 
But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. Now, let me just pause and say, often you will find the phrase, he did that which was right like David his father, or he did that which was not right like David his father. And uh, uh, they, they, he, there are often times the Lord will have this phrase like David his father. Now, David wasn't directly Ahaz's father, but he was great, 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 great grandfather back. And, and he didn't follow. David was the pattern for the kings of Judah. And, and really, to be very honest, Jeroboam was the pattern for the kings of Israel. And the kings of Israel for the mo completely followed the pattern of Jeroboam, which was wickedness. The kings of Judah, some of them followed the pattern of David, which was righteousness, and some of them did not. And Ahaz was one who did not. Verse 2, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Now, for a few moments, I just want you to see what the Bible is saying. Number one, there was a hellish rebellion in this passage. A hellish rebellion in this passage. A hellish rebellion from Ahaz against God. Ahaz against God's word. Ahaz against what was right and decent. Ahaz against societal norms and expectations. Ahaz even against his own children. It was an absolute hellish rebellion. The Bible says here that he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom. That means he would set up an idol to the god Tophet and he would call for the, the god to be worshipped and the drums of Tophet would be worshipped. And do you know how they would be appeased? Let me, let me say, I believe I could make an airtight case from the Bible tonight that behind every idol is a demon. And I'm not just using hyperbole or exaggeration. You find the idols of this world filled, you find them motivating men, manipulating men, intimidating men, binding men. That's demonic in its core. And any culture and any religion that worships idols, whether it's uh, Catholicism, for instance, they worship the idols called the saints. And they put the Pope on a pedestal, and he's an idol in and of himself. I'm speaking of ideas here. I'm not speaking against people. I'm speaking of ideas. But the truth of the matter is, is Catholicism is idolatry. And you know how I know this to be an absolute fact? Because if you study Exodus chapter 20, the second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Do you know what the Catholic Ten Commandments does? It erases the second commandment. And it doubles up the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. Now, I don't know who has the authority to do that, but I sure don't. Your pastor sure doesn't. Kendall Park Baptist Church doesn't. And no church or religion or religious leader has the authority to cut and slice and, and manipulate the Ten Commandments to suit your own fancy. And that's why I know that the Ten Commandments, uh, that's why I know that the Catholicism is idolatry. They want to worship their idols and their images made uh, by man's hands. Uh, Hinduism is idolatry. Again, I speak of ideas, not people. I want to make that clear. But we have to speak of ideas. If we can't speak of ideas in an objective, non-emotional way, then we have no reason to even meet. We should all go home because there's no point. So Hinduism is idolatry. In fact, they worship tens of thousands of gods. Buddhism is idolatry. I, I want to make that exceedingly clear. I had a young man challenge me on that a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> and, and I asked him, have you ever been in a Buddhist temple? He said, no. I said, well, I have. I was in the largest Buddhist temple in Singapore, and do you know it was a building probably about this size as far as width and length. It was probably twice as tall, maybe, maybe twice, maybe a little bit taller, and right there was a great big 10-foot tall, maybe 12-foot tall statue of the Buddha. On one side and on the other were his assistant gods. Can you imagine being God and needing an assistant? <clears throat> 
all over the walls, there were little, little statues of the Buddha that people would pay $1,000 to put on their, their walls, and they would worship them. I watched with my own two eyes as many dear, sincere, well-meaning people walked in, grabbed a black robe, sat down or kneeled down at a little bench, opened up a prayer book and read in a, in a mantra sort of a, a, a syncopated kind of a, a, a tone. They would read prayers and pray and worship the Buddha. This was the tooth Buddha or the, the tooth temple. In fact, we went upstairs, and we went upstairs in a certain part of the temple, and there on a pillow, a red pillow with, with an airtight case with gold tiles everywhere that you could pay $10,000 to put in the upstairs airtight compartment, there on a red pillow was supposedly one of the Buddha's teeth. And they had a priest monitoring. You had to take your shoes off when you went in. That, my friends is idolatry and there's demonism behind it uh, i went down the street to the hindu temple the oldest hindu temple and they had they had idols in the hindu temple M many different idols you had to pay uh, to buy some food to feed the idols and the and then watch as music was played and the the idol was fed i guess it was the idol's cafeteria i don't know but uh that was where they were fed and then they were watered and they were bathed again i'm not speaking ill of people here i'm speaking ill of false ideas and hinduism is a false idea Allah and Muslim, Muslim, uh, uh, that the Muslim religion is idolatry. Do you know that Allah is not the same? It is not a synonym to God. Don't ever believe that. That's what the media wants you to believe. That's what the politicians want you to believe. But it's not the same. Uh, Allah is the moon god, the false moon god that Muhammad worshipped. And just uh, out of convenience, he uh, amalgamated some of the Old Testament uh, prophets in with his, his Quran. And, and he wrote these things down. And they worship the moon god. And they worship the black rock where Allah or Muhammad is supposedly buried. That is, my friends, idolatry. And behind every idol is a demon. And it is absolute hellish rebellion against the one true God to worship idols. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up unto their own lust. Hear it, ladies and gentlemen. Idolatry is darkness and it leads to darkness. And so there was idolatry. He was worshiping this god, Tophet, and the drums were beating, and they were, they were to, to appease the god, Tophet, they would offer their children. They would take their little babies, like you have in the nursery downstairs, and they would throw their babies alive into the burning inferno, the lap of the god, Tophet. And supposedly that was the way to appease his wrath. That is hellish rebellion. This is not a pagan nation that is doing this. This is not a godless nation that is doing this. This is not a third world nation that is doing this. This is Judah. And in Judah, the king was worshiping idols. The Bible says he set up an idol in every corner of Jerusalem. In another passage, it says he set up an idol under every green tree. That means you didn't see it a little bit. You saw it a lot. And idolatry brings with it demonism. It brings with it a, a, a paganism that is, that is dark and that is sinister and brings ignorance and blight everywhere you look. It doesn't elevate the society and it doesn't elevate the people in the society. It just decimates the society. A few years ago, I was in Haiti preaching in 2017. Some precious, precious people that were there. And, and we, were, we were going from place to place. And the missionary said, would you like me to take you to the market? And I said, sure. So we drove down the road, went into the market, just flooded with people, lots of people there. And, and uh, we went into the market. And he said, do you see those robes, small little white and red robes that were hanging in the market? I said, yes. He said, I said, what are those? He said, those are wedding robes. I said, oh, yes. He said, when the, when the girls marry demons... Very, very dark. Very tragic. 
This is not an elevation of society. What does idolatry and demonism do? It degrades the society. And you rest assured there's a lot of idolatry and demonism in our world right now. In America, not a little bit, a whole lot. And it's the antithesis of Christianity. It's against the word of God. It's going to drag our society backwards, not forwards. It's going to take us and plunge us into great darkness and into an abyss. And it needs to be withstood at every twist and turn with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to see, number one, there was a hellish rebellion. Uh, Ahaz had a chance he had a chance to get things right when God sent judgment. Do you know what he did? Instead of getting things right, he sent a letter to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, and he said something that would have made a really good prayer. He said, I am thy servant and thy son. Come down and help me. And that led to more idolatry. I want you to understand, this was hellish rebellion. Now, folks, look here. You can look the other way when rebellion goes on in our society. You can go along with rebellion that goes on in our society. You can encourage rebellion that goes on in your society. But it will always have a price tag, a very hefty price tag. Notice number one, there was a hellish rebellion. Look at number two, there was a horrible reward. Look at verse number five. Wherefore, when the word wherefore is in the Bible, it's some derivative of the word why, or this is why. Wherefore, it's saying this is why, verse number five, wherefore the Lord, his God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter for Pekah. The son of Remaliah slew in Judah an hundred and twenty thousand in one day, which were all valiant men because that they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Now watch this. Again, turning away from God brings darkness and damnation. And that's what happened. Uh, here you have Judah, the southern nation, Judah and Benjamin. Then you have the ten northern tribes directly north of them. And then you have Syria. Syria was the nation just north of that. And God sent Syria down against Judah. Syria has been an, an enemy of Israel for many, many years, but now we're speaking specifically of Judah. And God sent Syria down against Judah because of Ahaz's rebellion. By the way, it wasn't just Ahaz that was rebelling. He had, he had captains, he had counselors, even had a high priest that was corrupt. He had people that went along with it. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot be neutral on issues of the day. You can't be. You can't look the other way and stick your head in the sand. And, and then you especially can't do that under the guise of piety. You can't do that. No, there's no such thing as secular and sacred in the life of a Christian. Everything is sacred. And so we make our decisions based upon principle and upon God and upon morals and upon what's right. We make our political decisions and we make our, we make our moral decisions. We make our family decisions. We make our ethical decisions. We make our economic decisions based upon what is right and what is decent. And you can't be neutral. You can't be neutral. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. And so Ahaz wasn't the only rebel. There was a whole society of rebel, rebels that went along with his rebellion and were okay with it. The high priest could have withstood him, but he did not. He had captains that could have withstood him, but they did not. He had counselors that could have withstood him, but they did not. He went full bore into this rebellion and everybody just followed suit. Nobody, it doesn't look like there were very many people withstanding him. Now, obviously there were. We'll see in a moment somebody that, that withstood rebellion wickedness but but the fact is is that that God was judging a nation because of their rebellion you follow down a hellish rebellion path and God will send you a horrible reward the wages of sin is death young people listen to me you cannot sin and get by what the sin has always a heavy price tag it will always cost you far more than you want to pay I was telling pastor yesterday that 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 the New Jersey turnpack reminds me of sin it takes you farther than you want to go keeps you longer than you want to stay and costs you far more than you want to pay. That, that's what sin does. No, no, it, it's Pennsylvania too, not New Jersey. Don't take it personal. And, and uh, I want you to understand, sin is not good, it's bad. Sin will take you down. It will keep you long. It will ruin and scar and mar and wreck, and it's doing that right here. Now God sends Syria down, and on the way, Syria allies with Israel, and Israel comes against their own people in a quasi-civil war and kills in one day, 120,000. Not just anybody, 
120,000 valiant men, soldiers, protectors, fathers, husbands, sons. In one day, 120,000 young men are destroyed and 200,000 are taken captive. I mean, the news is staggering. It's tragic what's taken place in Buffalo yesterday, but Buffalo would be far and away outshadowed by what happened in Judah on this day. Had they happened at the same time, look at what happened in verse number six. It says, they, they, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers, and Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king, and the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons and daughters and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So get the picture now. Don't just be here and don't be thinking about what you're planning to do or what kind of Dagwood sandwich you're planning to make after the service. Now follow with me here. I want you to see it. Judah sinned. Ahaz led the sin in rebellion. God sent judgment through Syria, an outside invading nation. On the way down, Syria allied with Israel and got their help, and they both created a strike force that killed 120,000 valiant soldiers and took 200,000 captives. And it sounds like that that Israel allied in, in this context. It sounds like Israel allied with Syria so that they could have a boost in their economy through the slaves from the south. 200,000 slaves? That might help your economy. 200,000 200, prisoners, you could put them to work somewhere. Cheap labor, and God wasn't pleased. I want to say something to you. God's not pleased with our anger. Many times we feel like we're justified in our anger. But even sometimes when we feel like we're justified, it's unjustified. Have you ever thought, sir, that your anger is ruining your marriage? Or at the very least, keeping it from being what God wants it to be? Have you ever thought, ma'am, that your anger is ruining your, your marriage and your children? We would sometimes justify our anger and think it's right, and we rant and rave and foment and explode, or, or we bottle it all up inside, and we're just a slow burn. I haven't preached a message on it, but someday I'm going to preach a message about anger, and I'm going to have the first point calling the hot spot anger number one. Second point, I'm going to have the anger rage called a uh, rage monster. The third point, I'm going to have the anger person, the, the anger object being the slow burn. Some people just kaboom, they're just a short fuse and they blow up to everyone around them. They don't care where the chips fall. Let the chips fall where they may. That's their attitude. Other people are hot spot. They're just always hot, always at a certain temperature and above and you can't get too close to them. You just feel the heat emanating from them. Third people are slow burns. They just keep it all inside. Until pretty soon, the teapot goes off. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I want to say most of our anger is not justifiable. These preacher, I have a right to be angry at all this wickedness in the world. Well, I, I get that there's a lot of wickedness. But you know, as a Christian, you have a lot to be joyful about. You go ahead and try to be joyful and angry at the exact same time. Now, now there should be, we, we should be angry at, angry at wrong. We should be angry at wickedness. But you know, I don't think that God intended for us to be angry constantly. I don't think that. I don't believe that. You can make that case from the Bible. We should look at evil. We should call evil evil. It should bother us. But we don't have to dwell on it. You know what I did last year? Two best, the, the best things I ever did. I got off Twitter and I turned off the news. Two of the best things you can ever do. Let me encourage you. If you're an older person, I'm speaking like real, real old. <laughs> like 55 and above. Anyway, if you're an old person here, if you're an old person here, just turn off the news. The news hooks you into thinking that you are part of the solution when you're not. And they sell their, their, their mantra. I think that we should make CNN, Fox News, and Newsmax all hit an all-time record low. Just nobody watch it. It, it. God did not make you to know about the tragedy here, and then the, the tsunami over here, and then the earthquake over here, and then the mass killings over here, and this over here. God didn't make you to, he didn't make you to know all that stuff. 
And somehow I really believe it happened after 9-11. We went to a 24-hour news cycle that was there already, but boy, it exploded after that. And do you know what their desire is? What the newscaster's desire is? Your money, your time in their pocket. I turned it off. Best thing I ever did. And you know what? I'm not as angry as I used to be. I'm not as upset about everything all the time. Now, I don't have to listen to all that. I, I'm not part of the solution. Now, if I'm part of the solution, I can do it. You say, well, preacher, you can pray. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many of you are really having a robust prayer life as you watch Fox News delineate all the terrible tragedies just thrown out in front of you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not buying it. And I want to say that there's anger. Sometimes there's anger because of injustice within our family. And we see something that's wrong, and we want to react to it, and we want to respond to it, and, and it's not right. This case, there was anger because of what was going on in the nation. There was anger, obviously, between Israel and Judah. And Israel decided to monopolize on, on this judgment from God. And they took up with a, a nation to the north, and they came down, killed 120,000 of their brethren. Took 200,000 women, sons, and daughters captive. And it didn't please God. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 28 in verse number 9. It says, as they brought the spoil to Samaria, verse 9, it says, but a prophet of the Lord was there. A, a prophet of the Lord was in Samaria, whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven. I wonder if God's got, if God, his attention is focused on your anger, on my anger. I wonder if it, if it bothers heaven. I wonder if it hurts the heart of God. We think we're also right and justified in being angry. I have righteous indignation. Well, there is definitely a such a thing as righteous indignation, but all the time and constantly and at a certain temperature and a level that is constant. Now, I'll guarantee you people die. I'm, I'm not undermining diet here. I'm not undermining a good, healthy diet. Everybody needs a salad. I had a salad today, thank the Lord, before dessert, and that was really a progress step. But anyway, uh, uh, everybody needs to eat healthy. But do you know what I believe? I believe this from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. People don't die because of bad diets. Now, go take that to your doctor, and if you're a doctor, I'm not trying to be contradictory and pur purposely, purposely troublesome. Uh, uh, and I, I do believe in ice cream. How many of you believe in ice cream? Okay, good, wonderful. I've got a lot of fans in the audience. But look here. You know what people die of? Stress. Constant stress. And choosing to live in a level of stress. That's what I believe most is the biggest killer. And it's the silent killer. Now, my sister, she died of cancer when she was 44, and she found out she had it when she was 40. She had 11 children when she died, so she had a lot of stress in her home. Anyway, <laughs> she had, and she homeschooled them. Oh, man, she had a lot of stress. I used to think homeschool wasn't a big, big deal, but then I realized it's purgatory. But anyway, uh, my, my sister, she had, she, had, uh, she had a lot going on, and I thank the Lord. She was a sweet, sweet lady, and she, she was an incredible person, and she tried to fight her cancer through diet. Now, Look here, I'm, I'm not against that. If you, you believe the best way to fight stuff like that is chewing on a celery stick, good, God bless you. And I think that chewing on a celery stick is good, and there's some great things to add to it, like peanut butter. That's a really good thing. And cream cheese is really helpful. And cottage cheese, in fact, any other kinds of really good dip, it just helps a celery stick. <laughs> but I want to say something to you that uh, I, I don't think that diet... And changing your diet is the number one factor. It may be a helpful factor, and I'm not trying to give bad information here. I just believe stress is a primary factor. And what's part of stress? Anger. Like, I, I, I'm not a doctor, but I'm giving you some good medical advice right now. Lower your anger, lower your rage. It's going to help you. It, and God sent this prophet to this, this slave train. 
200,000 people long. Probably, I don't know, I don't know, a thousand, how how many guards does it take to guard 200,000 people? 500? 1,000? 10,000? 20,000? 50,000? God sent a prophet. I'm so thankful for the beginning of verse 9. A prophet of the Lord was there. Thank God. This is God interrupting their anger. And I believe God sent me tonight to interrupt your anger. If you're angry and bitter and unforgiving, if you won't, won't let it go, if you keep talking about it all the time, if you can't think about anything else, if you wake up with it in the morning and go to bed with it at night, there's a problem. That needs to be dealt with. God sent Oded. I bet you even never even heard of Oded. I, I bet you've never even heard of Oded. How many of you thought of Oded last week? Mm-hmm. See, that's what I'm saying. Uh, we got one, one, maybe. <laughs> Oded, he read it in his devotions. That's cheating. Uh, how, how many of you, I bet some of you ladies have never even thought about naming your next son Oded. Somebody needs to name their son Oded. Here is Oded. Poor little prophet does something great for God and nobody names their kid after o, uh, Oded. That's a terrible thing. That's a tragedy of epic proportion. Somebody needs to deal with that. And all these babies being born around here, this would be good. It would be a blessing if you had a kid in your nursery named Oded. What's your kid's name? Oded. (laughs) I mean, wow, that would be something. That would be a deal breaker for for some people. But look at what it says in 2 Chronicles 28 and 9. It says, He came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hands, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth unto heaven. And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondmen women unto you but are there not with you even with you sins against the Lord your God look in the mirror before you point your finger that's what he's saying you've got problems of your own and you're gonna you're gonna blame everything on them and use this as an opportunity to take them notice verse 11 now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again which ye have taken captive of your brethren for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you That was the end of his message. He couldn't have been a Baptist preacher. (laughs) That's way too short of a message. (laughs) But watch. He, He said, you've got problems of your own. And he pointed them out. He reminded them that they were not guiltless. He reminded them that they were the objects of God's mercy and God's forgiveness. And a little bit of contemplation upon God's mercy and God's forgiveness will help you forgive. A little contemplation upon God's long suffering and God's grace in your life will help you forgive. Many times the reason we don't forgive and won't forgive is because we're not thinking about God's mercy and God's grace. We're just thinking about his justice. Well, thank God for his justice and his holiness, but those aren't the only attributes that God has. And God has these attributes in perfect balance, and we ought to strive to be like God, holding and mirroring his attributes in perfect balance. God's not just justice. He's not only holiness. God is a God of mercy and grace and long suffering. Micah 7, 8 says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth transgression and passeth by the transgression of his people? And he he remembereth not their iniquities, but he delighteth in mercy. That's our God. Well, thank God for this holy prophet. And thank God for this, number three, holy reminder. Number three, there was a holy reminder that says, no, nope, you're doing wrong. Uh, Suppose that Oded had a few second thoughts before he went out against this army and slave train. Suppose he had some second thoughts. By the way, do you suppose your preacher does? When your preacher starts to pointing his finger, and you know you have to have a long bony finger, well, at least a bony finger, to be able to be a preacher. That's a prerequisite requirement. If you're thinking about getting in the ministry, just examine that for a bit. And here, uh, he, you imagine when your preacher gets up and starts pointing his finger and pounding the pulpit and getting a little close to home, that's not something he jumps out of bed doing. Wow, who can I confront today? I'm going after my people, and they have been lazy and no good and slothful and indifferent and filled with apathy. Boy, I'm going to just have a time of my life this morning. No, he's thinking about it, and he's praying about it, and he's studying it, and he said, Oh, Lord, maybe I should stop being an expository preacher and go topical this week. And and, uh, I'm tired of this now. It's right here in front of me, and I've got this passage, and I've got to deal with it. I can't just skip over this chapter, and and maybe nobody will even notice that we skipped this chapter. And and can I go, can I? Oh, I'm going to have to really 
really deal with sin. And he, he's confronting sin. It's not something he enjoys. By the way, kids, when your parents confront you, that's not something they enjoy. They think about it. They try to think about ways that they can uh, avoid it or ways that they can uh, deal with it without confrontation. They pray about it. They, 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 they weigh it. They wake up with it in the morning, go to bed with it at night, and they're thinking and praying. And, and, and so Oded probably had that. Oh, did he hear something? What, what are all these soldiers going south for? And what's serious going on? And what's going Oh, Ahaz has been at it again. And God's judging Ahaz. And no doubt he walked with God and God revealed it to him. And now the soldiers are coming back, but they're not coming back by themselves. They've got 200,000 people in this slave train and they're going to put them to work in their economy to their own advantage. And, and Odin says, this isn't right. Suppose Odin thought for his life. He's withstanding and confronting men with sharp weapons. But Odad had character, and Odad had integrity, and Odad was willing to do what was right at the risk of his own life and stand for what was right and be God's instrument to interrupt their anger. And he did. And you know, not all stories in the Bible or in life end well, but this one did. And thank God for it. Look what the Bible says in verse 12. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah, the son of Meshillamoth, and Jehaziah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war and said unto them, Ye shall not bring in the captives hither, for whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass, for our trespass is great and there is fierce wrath against Israel. I want you to notice number four, the humble response. <laughs> There was a humble response from the top down. These certain heads of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, they say, hey, we've done wrong. This prophet is right. Thank God he's preaching the truth to us, and we're going to get right. Boy, that's great. Amen. That's one for the record books. That's a blessing. That's, a time, that's the kind of thing the preacher likes to think about. Now, preachers have all kinds of stories of people who, who did wrong. They were confronted in their wrong or they were warned not to do wrong and they just went headlong ahead in their plans and disregarded what the preacher said. I mean, what does the preacher know? He probably doesn't even have an accredited degree. And, and what does the preacher know? We're just going to head, go headlong and we're going to keep marching forward with our plans even though someone has been kind enough and godly enough and courageous enough and humble enough to warn us. And then they come back to the preacher's office with the pieces all in their hands. They say, hey, preacher, can you help me put this all back together? You don't know how many times a preacher wants to sit back in his chair and fold his arms and say, I told you so. You don't, you don't know how many times a preacher wants to sit back and say, well, why do you want to come get my help now? You didn't listen to my help ahead of time. But thank God for this response. These people did what was right. The men led in doing what was right. Men, if we're going to have revival this week, you're going to have to be in the leadership of it all. You're going to have to start this thing and spark this thing in your home. You're going to have to be the one that takes the lead. Don't wait for the women to do it. The women outwork and out-volunteer and out-serve the men in just about every church I'm in. Let's not, have that. Let's not let that happen. And by the way, ma'am, uh, by the way, ma'am, your husband's not going to be able to do it until you get out of the way. Your, your husband needs to lead, but he's not going to be able to lead if you don't step back and let him lead. That's called submission and righteousness. And, and so the men led, and the certain heads of the tribes came in, and they said, hey, no, we're not going to do this. This prophet is right. We're going to listen to him and send these captives back. I want you just to see, I, I want you to see their, uh, their, their humble response in four sections. I didn't give this to the, to the guys in the back. So this is just something you're going to have to remember. Number one, their response was this. They instructed them to see the chains. Would you say that with me just now? See the chains. Would you say it again? See the chains. See the chains. You said, preacher, where do you get that? All right, look at verse number 13. They said unto them, ye shall not bring in the captives hither. For whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to our, uh, add more sin, to, more to our sins and to our trespass? See the chains. Number one, see the chains. I want you to do that tonight. If you have taken somebody into captivity and say, I will not forgive them. I will not release them of the debt. That's what forgiveness is. Releasing someone of the debt. Unloosing their chains. 
I'm going to put them in further chains for the wrong that they did to me. They deserve it. Well, they may deserve it. Whatever they did probably was wrong. But you're putting them in chains doesn't make it unwrong. And it doesn't make it right. And it doesn't make, it doesn't solve the problem. I will not forgive them. When you say that in your heart and mind, I will not seek forgiveness and I will not offer forgiveness. By the way, both parties are responsible. God doesn't let either of us off the hook. Matthew 5, he says, if you come to offer your gift and you realize you have ought against your brother, leave your gift at the altar. Go and make it right with your brother. That means if God brings it to your attention, go, go, go seek, uh, uh, seek to offer forgiveness. Uh, and, and seek forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, the man who has been offended is supposed to tell the man who has caused the offense what has happened so that he can make it right. The goal isn't to slander. It's not to backstab. It's not to kick a guy while he's down. It's not to put him down. It's to say there was a wrong. There's an indiscrepancy. There is something wrong in the checkbook. It doesn't add up. And if you know you ought to go and seek forgiveness or you ought to go and offer forgiveness and you don't, that checkbook will never be reconciled, ever, until that's taken care of. The figures won't add up. And so here, <clears throat> he's, he's telling them, see the chains. Oh, by the way, Oded pointed it out. He says that in verse number nine. He says, the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, and he hath delivered them into your hands, and you have slain them in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven. You have slain them. And now, verse 10, you purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. Verse number 11, now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives again. Number one, see the chains. Would you say it? See the chains. Good. Number two. Number two, look what the Bible says. Not only should you see the chain, but look at verse number uh, nine. He says, you have slain them in a rage that reacheth unto heaven. Verse number 10 at the end. He says, are there not with you, even with you sins against the Lord your God? Number two, confess your stain. See the chains that you've brought someone under. See their chains. Number two, confess your stain. Again, look in the mirror before you point your finger. Look in your own eye before you cast out a, a, a little speck out of someone's eye, uh, else's eye. You've got a beam in your own eye. Confess your stain. Uh, yes, there's problems in this world. Yes, we have difficulty. Yes, sometimes there are offenses. Jesus said it's hard. It's impossible to live in a world without offenses. But he gave us a way to make it right. And he told us very clearly throughout other portions of Scripture that we're to deal with our own problems first. I like what one old preacher said. More than likely, the problem's with you. Start at your own doorstep. Start cleaning up your own life before you point out all the faults and failures of everybody else's. Number one, see, your, see the chains. Number two, confess your stain. Would you say it? Confess your stain. Would you say it again? Confess your stain. All right. Uh, number three, avoid more pain. Now look in verse number uh, 13. They said our trespass is great. They're seeing, they're, they're confessing their stain. There's fierce wrath against Israel. Look at that. Fierce wrath. Verse 11, he said, uh, the, the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Wow, these guys are quick learners, aren't they? I mean, the preacher didn't even have to preach a 15-message series on the subject before they got it. It's just a two-verse sermon or three, and they got it. Wow. Praise God. They, I mean, one of their points was, there's fierce wrath against you. And the leaders look at them and say, there's fierce, fierce wrath against us. You know what they were doing? Taking God at his word. Number three, avoid more pain. Would you say that? Avoid more pain. Uh, I mean, if you're going to go along in unforgiveness and anger and resentment and bitterness and grudge holding, and you're not going to forgive someone when you know that's a clear truth taught in the Bible and you don't even need the pastor to do another expository message on it. Well, then go, go ahead and drive your car over the cliff. Tell me how that works out for you. Tell, tell me how you enjoy that. You could completely avoid further pain if you would stop right now and ask the Lord's forgiveness and go and seek forgiveness and offer forgiveness. But if you don't, are, are, are you sadistic? Do you love pain? Do you love to inflict it upon yourself? Do you love to inflict it upon others? You think you're, being, you're, you're freeing yourself by bringing someone else into captivity. 
You, you think that somehow you're doing a good deed by refusing to forgive someone. And you probably know all that they've done that's wrong. I mean, you could tell me in great detail tonight all that they've done that's wrong. Is, is that the way you're going to do? Why don't you just avoid more pain? Number one, uh, see the chains. Number two, confess your stain. Number three, avoid more pain. Would you say it again? Avoid more pain. Number four, this is deep theology right here. I want to put it out here. I, 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 I'm going to try to get it down to where everyone can get it. This is real deep theology. Brother Josh John, he knows deep theology. I could tell he knows deep theology. Are you ready? Here's number four. Use your brain. <laughs> okay? Would you say that? Use your brain. I'm not trying to insult anybody. Please don't take it that way because I'm not. But sometimes, you know, I've kind of learned this, this uh, language by having teenagers. <laughs> I say, what were you thinking when you did that? You know how they say that teenagers, when they become teenagers, their brain dies and then fully resets. And I, I'm coming very, very strongly to believe in this. I have good teenagers and I thank God for my boys. But, boy, you know, that's a, that's a true. So what were you thinking when you did this? Use your brain. Use that gray matter between your ears. But, you know, teenagers aren't the only one that seem to act like their brain is gone. Right? Sometimes we fully grown adults act as though we're three years old and we won't forgive. And we think we've got a right to not forgive. No, 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 no. Use your brain. Let's do an illustration right here. Let's, let's help this, okay? You do what I do, okay? This will help us understand. Are you ready? Here we go. I need everybody's participation. All right, there. Mrs. Brown, she wasn't participation. A few others, I'm going to call you out. Here we go. And you won't get a brownie and ice cream after church. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right, watch this now. You know what that is? That's me when I decide I'm going to do things different than the Bible. That's me. What, what happened to Dad? Uh, He's lost his mind. He doesn't usually blow up like that. It wasn't that big of a deal. He made a mountain out of a molehill. That's when my wife goes. That's right. That's right. What happened to so-and-so? I thought they were a member of this church. Yeah, I know. But they haven't been here in the last four months. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, and, and I saw them the other day, and they were coming out of the bar. Yeah. We lose our mind when we don't obey the Bible. Or we've lost our mind when we won't obey the Bible. What happened to her? She's mad about something and won't forgive somebody else in the church. And it's like this thing was seven years ago. What happened to her? I don't know, but she talks about it all the time. And she's got to be in her bonnet about it. And she just won't be, be quiet about it. Right? All right, let's do this again and, and with a positive note on this illustration. Are you ready? Here, you do what I do. Here we go. Ready? You know what that is? That's you when you decide you're going to obey the Bible. Did you see so-and-so was at church? Yeah. And they were singing. And they acted like they enjoyed it. What happened? I don't know. Let me tell you. Maybe they found that whatsoever is up there. <laughs> well, did you see, see, did you see John? John was in church today with his wife, and he acted like he actually loved her. And he sat close to her. And he held her hand going up and out and got the door for her. He, he's never treated his wife that way. What, what happened to old John? Well, he came to. Whenever you and I decide we're going to obey the Bible, wow, there is something up there. We weren't quite sure after a while. But whenever you and I decide we're not going to obey the Bible, that's not the brightest bulb on the tree. I'm not sure. There must not be the sharpest crayon in the box. When we obey God, there's nothing but good that can come from it. When we don't obey God, there's nothing but good that will come of it. Nothing good that will come of it. Do you see? So I, I've interrupted your anger tonight. Maybe you were angry this weekend. Maybe you were angry this last week. Maybe you were angry on your way to church. Maybe you're angry about something right now. Maybe you came in seething. 
Maybe you're the hot spot, or maybe you're the angry bird, or maybe you're the, the, the volcano, or maybe, maybe you're the slow burn. I, I don't know. But somebody came and interrupted your anger. And likely, if, if my guess is right, I'm not the only one, and I'm not the first one, and I won't be the last one. But what are you going to do with it? I was preaching along these lines some time ago, and, the, and the, the pastor where I was preaching came to me after the service, during the invitation, and we stood right here in a church about this size. And he said, kill your mic. I said, sir, he said, kill your mic. So I, I obediently reached down and turned my mic off. He said, what do I do now? I said, what do you mean, what do you do now? He said, my dad, when he was 60 or 70, left my mom for another woman much younger and ruined her emotionally and financially. And he said, I never got over it, and she never got over it. And I felt all this time I had a right to be angry at him and to be unforgiving. And now he is dead. What do I do now? This was a preacher many years my senior, and I wasn't quite sure what to tell him. I said, well, pastor, I said, you can't live under false guilt if you go to Jesus and you ask him to forgive you. He'll forgive you. And I said, I don't know, maybe you could write a letter to him or go to his grave and, 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 and just tell him that you, you're sorry and, and ask for his forgiveness, wherever, however that might happen. This is what he did. He took to the pulpit and he told the people what he had just told me. And he said, I wouldn't blame you if you asked for my resignation. He said, Dad, wherever you're at, I want you to forgive me for my unforgiveness and my one willingness to release you from whatever debt I felt you owed me. That was a humble response. And God's looking for some humble responses tonight. Would you bow with me in prayer? Now, there's never a time, ladies and gentlemen, when God gives his word and he does not hold us responsible. That means whenever God's word is preached, we're held responsible by what we hear and how we respond. I want to ask you to respond humbly tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You've listened so attentively. I wonder with your heads bowed and eyes closed if you'd say, Brother Smith. I'd like to ask Brother Drew if he'd come and sing and and I'd like to ask Miss John if she'd come and play a few verses of Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. I wonder with your heads bowed and your eyes closed if you say, Brother Dwight, I'm saved, but tonight God has convicted me about some anger or some unforgiveness in my heart that I need to make right. Would you pray that I would? There have been hurts, there have been wrongs in recent days or in recent years. And, and sometimes I just don't know how I can go on. Would you pray for me that God would help me to forgive, to seek forgiveness or to offer it or both? If that's you, heads bowed, eyes closed, God spoke into your heart. Would you just slip up your hand and let me pray with you? Is there anybody like that? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Good. Thank God. Wonderful. Anybody else? Good. Okay. Just slip it up and put it right back down. Slip up your hand, put it right back down. Wonderful. All right. Anybody else? Question number two, how many of you can say, Preacher, without doubt, I know that I'm saved. I have been forgiven by accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. If you can say that, would you slip your hand up high as a testimony to that fact? Preacher, I know I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Thank you, man. Put your hands down. Good. All right, now, if you couldn't say that, but you said, Preacher, I, I'd like to know, and I'd like to be sure, would you pray for me? If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Preacher, my need is not to forgive. My need is to accept Christ's forgiveness and be born again. Anyone at all? If you're listening by way of live stream and you've never been born again, tonight you can be. If you'll bow your heart before the King of kings and Lord of lords and confess Him as your Savior and that you're a sinner in need of His salvation alone, if you'll believe that he died and rose again right there, he'll save you. Just bow your heart before the Lord. Tell him you're a sinner and that you know you need a Savior and you want him alone to be your Savior and call upon him and ask him to save you. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, bless this invitation. Many of my brothers and sisters raised their hand and said there's someone they need to forgive. There's some way they need to either seek or offer forgiveness. Give us courage to do that. 
And Lord, I pray that at this point, we'd not only have courage to do that, but we'd have courage to get that thing right before you. In Jesus' name, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The pianist is giving us a chord, and Brother Drew is singing.